So Wait uh, was born in 19, 1899 in Brooklyn, New York. Um, and his parents were Ad and Eloise, that's a typo, sorry about that, Ad and Eloise. And his father, Wait kind of came from his, he kind of came to his, uh, his uh, uh, stage presence kind of naturally in that his dad was part of a group called the Ad Addison Ad Hoyt Minstrels uh, that performed in New York vaudeville uh, circles. And uh, so Hoyt grew up with a father who was uh, a, a performer. He went to Erasmus High School in Brooklyn, was a star on the baseball team there, and was signed by the New York Giants out of high school. For many years, Wade was called the schoolboy wonder. That was one of his nicknames because he was signed at such a young age. Uh, but he came out of Erasmus High School, uh, signed at the age of 15 for $90 a month and a $5 bonus. Uh, just a, a reminder of how far, how things have changed in baseball over the years. He made his major league debut in 1918 at the age of 19, and he debuted, I, I gotta double check this, but I'm pretty sure he de debuted with Boston. He started his career, eventually wound up with Boston, started his career at Boston, and then moved on to the Yankees. Um, but here's a story, he's, this is a story that Wade tells, uh, this next slide, from uh, his minor league days, when he was playing in the, I believe it was the Southern League, and he's, they're playing in New Orleans. And this would have been roughly 19, uh, 15, 1916, sometime uh, around in there. So uh, this involves uh, uh, he and a, and a teammate of his uh, on a lark one night in the hotel, and they get themselves into some trouble, and you'll hear him talk about that. Uh, and uh, they, they actually end up going to the police station, but this is the, the story that, that Wade tells. <laughs> I can tell this one or not, but anyway, when I was with the Nashville club, oh, the, the, a couple of years before playing in the Southern League with Nashville, why we were staying at a hotel down there called the DeSoto in New Orleans. I believe that was the name, the DeSoto, if I'm not mistaken. And that was way back in 1980. 18, I think, or 17. At any rate, uh, we were over the French market one night. It was very hot. We went over the French market, and then we bought ourselves some, a couple of ball players, myself. Probably named Gus Helfrich. He afterwards became a, uh, an officer in the Westchester County, New York, traffic department. But at any rate, Gus was my roommate. And we went over the French market, and we bought some cantaloupes. <laughs> sent down to the, to get back to the hotel, uh, the, the things were warm and it was a very hot night and uh, we wanted to ice these things a little bit so we sent down for some ice and we put the ice in the bathroom sink and put the cantaloupes in the sink. Well, we were on about the 12th floor and uh, at any rate, the <laughs> in New Orleans and those places in the hot weather and some of those hotels, why, if you leave uh, anything similar to refuse around there, why, <laughs> why, uh, why we'll attract some insects. All right, right, right we, after eating the cantaloupe, we decided to dispose of the, of the rinds and we pitched them out the window. And unfortunately, one of the rinds of nearly a half a cantaloupe <laughs> Descended and struck a portly gentleman on the side of a straw hat. And it broke off the side of the straw hat and descended on the portly gentleman's shoulder and the seeds and some wayward juice. Descended down his, cascaded down his white suit and of course that incensed him a great deal. Uh, people walking the streets of New Orleans around 11 o'clock at night do not expect to have cantaloupes descend on them, nor do they expect to have, be covered
covered with cantaloupe seeds, nor juice, although watermelon and cantaloupe are very, very common down in that vicinity, but not coming out of hotel windows. They usually come out of the kitchens and not out of the windows. So, at any rate, pretty soon, at the, we saw what was going to occur as the gentleman was a bit incensed and called a gin down or an officer of the law, and the uh, help which my roommate got in bed, and I got in bed, but at that time I was only 17 years old. Whereupon there was some loud knocking at the door, and an officer stood there with a the portly gentleman, and of course he made me believe we were asleep, but the only thing wrong with the picture was that I forgot to muss my hair, having just gotten into bed, and my hair being combed very nicely and not looking as if I had been in bed any length of time but about a minute. <laughs> Why? <laughs> I was apprehended. <laughs> and I was otherwise walked off to the jug. <laughs> and I was inca incarcerated with some with some uh, people with some real bad characters, by the way, who had been cutting up some fancy touches in New Orleans late at night. And they get, I was hauled off in front of the judge and I had to keep from, I had to keep biting my cheek in the side inside of my mouth to keep from laughing through all this, although according to the portly gentleman whose hat was broken and whose seeds were on the thing, why, I was a fit subject for Boys Town. At any rate, the judge read me a lecture and he asked me why I had why this had occurred, and I told him, well, we, I noticed the water parks around here in New Orleans are as big as the horses we have up home, and uh, I didn't want to leave the refuse around, so he threw it in the first place he could find it. So he read me a lecture on what should happen, and the, the, the fellow that uh, was struck was very incensed about the whole thing. Well, we made friends, we made up, because the portly gentleman was really a good fellow at heart, and we paid for the dry cleaning of his suit, bought him a new hat, Nothing happened to me in a legal way except the manager of the bar club, Roy Ellen, fined me $25 for getting, uh, and then, man, this is all an innocence now, mind you. There's nothing premeditated about this whole thing. But so you can see how you have to be careful because you can find yourself in trouble very, very easily, especially if you like cantaloupe, which is the moral of the story. In other words, if you like cantaloupe, be careful of the rhyme. This is one of the stories that comes off of the two albums that were produced in the early 1960s of Waits' uh, Rain Stories. And, and you're hearing, this is uh, taken from a broadcast during a rain delay, so you can hear a little of the organ music in the background, and maybe a little bit of crowd noise. But in many of these cases, he is also in the booth with his broadcast partner. And so you do hear wait sometimes. I mean, I think when he's giggling, it's partly because his broadcast partner is starting to laugh. And so Wait's starting to find all this very humorous. But that was one of the things that was so appealing about Wait. He just had this very infectious laugh. Uh, it was a great laugh. Um, so he played two years with the Red Sox and traded to the Yankees in 1921, joining Babe Ruth. And for the rest of his life, um, well, in his professional life after baseball, he became a huge uh, defender and promoter of the Babe as the greatest player to ever live. And he was his teammate for a number of years. And uh, Hoyt uh, always talked about Bruce's larger than life personality and of course all of his batting exploits. And he was a very fierce defender of Bruce's Bruce reputation uh, all during the rest of his life, which came into some play Later on, when Hank Aaron began his uh, serious run in the early 70s at toppling Bruce's record, and uh, Wade was, uh, uh, would defend Ruth because uh, he felt like that Aaron had, had played in far more games. He didn't hit home runs at the rate at which Ruth did. Uh, he, he just became a very fierce defender. But uh, nonetheless, I mean, uh, Ruth, of course, even though Aaron broke his home run record, there was no way that Aaron or anybody else was gonna supplant Babe in the public imagination. Uh, it's like trying to outdo Elvis. It's just not gonna happen, you know? Um, 
So this is this. I believe this next slide is a story of uh, Ruth. Let's see. When he, uh, I mean, with they. I'm sorry. Yeah, 1921. When Wade just joined the Yankees. This is his first year with the Yankees, and this comes late in the season. They uh, are playing the Indians in New York in a battle for first place. The Yankees lead the Indians by just one game. Uh, and so it's a very critical game right at the end of the season. Wade pitches most of this game. Uh, uh, all of his details are a little fuzzy. Some of his details are a little fuzzy, but that's okay. This was 40 years afterwards, so we'll give him a, we'll give him a break on that. But this is his recollection of that, of this uh, early game. So in the last game of that, uh, that uh, crucial series, and Cleveland jumped on Quinn in the first inning for three runs, I think, before Quinn got anybody out. And before we knew what was happening, I was in there without, any, without anyone out, and I got him out, and the game seesawed back and forth. And I can remember my feelings and my, my actual determinations in that ball game, uh, because the ball players kept telling you on the bench, bear down, bear down, bear down. And all I remember sitting on the bench in between innings, because this was the first if we won the pennant, it would be the first time that the Yankees had ever won the pennant in the history of baseball, you see. And consequently, it was going to provide the first all-city series in New York uh, in the history of the World Series, although the White Sox and Chicago Cubs had provided the first intra-city series years before in Chicago, but it would have been the first time two New York clubs had played. So, of course, we were very anxious to win this thing, and uh, not only anxious, but because we, a lot of us, had never played in the World Series, and we were very anxious to do that also. And I can remember, uh, I was 21 years old at the time, and I, was, I, I remember the, the uh, anxiety and, and, the, and the, I suppose, the effervescence of youth that, that brought all your emotions to the top and just drove you on to sit on the bench in between innings and keep saying to yourself, bear down, bear down, put everything you got on every pitch. Put everything you got on every pitch, and that's what we did. We went out there, uh, we just tried to keep the pitches outside and all types of batters so they wouldn't hit the ball in the seat, and just bear down and rear back and throw the ball as hard as you could. And I can remember for the last about six games of the season that year, trying to adopt the style of Grover Cleveland Alexander, in turning around and scrunching up your shoulders, bringing your knee up close to your chin and trying to hide the ball as much as you can, turning it back to the batter so that he wouldn't get a good sight of the ball, and then letting fly with everything that you had just as hard as you could throw the ball. And the game seesawed back and forth, and, it, and uh, we tied the score, then we went ahead, then uh, Cleveland tied the score, and, they, and the Ruth hit a home run, and we went ahead again, and we got down to the eighth inning, and the score was, I think, seven to six in favor of, of uh, Cleveland, or some score like that, and Ruth fell at another home run and put us ahead eight to seven. And I was so tired and so worn out in, in that thing, not only from throwing the ball as hard as I could, but I guess from my own emotion and anxiety that I was really uh, going loose in the eighth inning. And they took me out and they put God, Carl Mays in. Mays got out of the inning, but now remember in those days the games used to start at 3.15 in the afternoon. And now it's 5.15, and in those days the season used to run longer into October. And this was in early October, the night shadows were falling, and the polo grounds was always sort of a dark, a dark ballpark, and the purple shadows were deepening in the polo grounds, and they were lowering and lowering, and there was sort of a haze over the field, and it was a very dramatic setting. And in that ball game, in the ninth inning, Mays walked, uh, didn't walk, man, but he loaded the bases, three on base, and a good 300 hitting catcher, Steve O'Neill, at the plate for, uh, for the Cleveland Indians. And I can remember that Colonel Jacob Rupert, who owned the Rupert Brewery at the time, and Rupert's Brewery was in the bullpen with us. And I was out of the game, but I didn't go in the clubhouse as I stood down in the bullpen, way down in the deep shadows and center, trying to watch the home plate. And Rupert was walking up and down in front of the bullpen pen players saying, I give you the Brewery, I give you the Brewery, win the pennant, win the pennant, I give you the Brewery. And finally we saw Mays with the count of two and two on the needle wind up in that underhand pitch of his and come in there with the ball, and we saw O'Neill swing. Now, then we saw the center fielder start back. We didn't know whether he was, Elmer Miller, his name was, we didn't know whether he was going back for the ball or because the game was over, because the center, you see the clubhouses were in center field. And suddenly we realized that O'Neill had struck out, but it took us several minutes to register that. And then everything following that ball game, we won at eight to seven, and this is an actual uh, vital statistic uh, fact. Uh, that there were two or three people that died in the grandstand that, that afternoon from heart, 
failure. That, that's really the actual, uh, that's really the truth. And uh, it was one of the most memorable occasions that I can ever recall. Well, wait, nobody died. <laughs> um, that, that part of it's a little bit of a myth. But nonetheless, just a dramatic moment early in his career. Uh, by the way, that game played at the Polo Grounds, and for those of you who remember baseball in the 50s with the New York Giants, that's where the Giants played the Bobby, famous Bobby Thompson home run in 1951, was in the Polo Grounds, and at that time, the Yankees also played in the Polo Grounds. The Yankee Stadium was not yet open, and so the, the Giants played in the Polo Grounds, and so did the, so did the Yankees. Both teams uh, shared the facility. So, um, Let's move to, okay, sort of a rundown here on Waite's uh, career. He played with the Yankees for 10 seasons, six World Series. Teammates included Ruth, Lou Gehrig, Earl Combs, who was from Kentucky, played, uh, I think he was a center fielder. Uh, Bob Musial, uh, Joe Dugan, Tony Lazari, uh, Herb Pinnock, a pitcher, and uh, the catcher, uh, Bill Dickey, who was, uh, I mean, several of those guys are in the Hall of Fame. So he had a heck of a group to play with. When he left the Yankees after 1930, uh, a story that's uh, perhaps more apocryphal than anything else, but uh, nonetheless, it's a cute story. Wait, uh, was, uh, had, had been told he'd been traded to, uh, uh, to I think it was the uh, athletics. And, uh, you know, he, he's going to now have to tell goodbye to all these guys that he'd played with. Uh, from his time as, a, as a, you know, around 20 years old, 21 years old. So these are the guys who were really close to him. And of course, he was very close to, to Ruth. And uh, he's going through the clubhouse, and shaking hands with everybody, and he saves Babe to the end. Now, Babe had this terrible habit, or not terrible habit, he, he just, he, remembering people's names for no, you know, it was just, that was a challenge for Babe. And so White gets over to him, and he sticks out his big paw, and Bruce looks up at him, and he says, so long, Walter. Good luck. Good luck in, in, with the Philadelphia Athletics. So long, Walter. That was close. Um, let's see what the next slide is. OK. I'm sorry, he went to the Tigers first, then Philadelphia. And then he winds up in the National League. And in fact, his last couple seasons are with Pittsburgh. And Wade Hoyt, the answer to a great trivia question, Wade Hoyt played for the Pirates in the mid-30s and won and, and appeared here on opening day and won two opening day games against the Reds in the mid-1930s when he was pitching in the National League in his last uh, couple of seasons. So this is, a, this is another uh, story. Uh, this is a... a uh, a day at Connie Mack Stadium when he was playing for the Philadelphia Athletics. And Jack Moran is in the booth. Jack Moran was his sidekick for a number of years in Cincinnati, uh, who was a, you know, the second guy in the booth with Wade. And at one point he asked Jack to kind of help him out with the story. So we'll listen to this. This is uh, Wade. Uh, you know, every pitcher, really, they don't want to talk about their pitching. They want to talk about their hitting. So this is a good example of that. Here we are talking about people that played here and like uh, Jack Coons, all that other bunch, and then you pass on to the Athletics of 21, Athletics of 27 with Mickey Cochran and, and uh, Lefty Grove and Jimmy Fox and Wahlberg and, uh, and Max Bishop and Joe Pauley and Jimmy Dykes and Buell Haas and Bing Miller and all that crowd. And you have all those people that are in and out of this ballpark. And it just occurred to me, believe it or not, that I played here myself. And I, didn't, and I had forgotten all about it. I was here with the Athletics the second half of the season, 31, and pitched right here in the World Series. He got beaten. Uh, but right here in the World Series of 31, and that's it. And I can, remember the, I can remember coming here from Detroit. I was sent here from Detroit on waivers in 1931 and won six straight for this club, uh, pitching for the Athletics in 31. But I wasn't in the best of condition. I can recall that. I was a little stout around the withers. And uh, uh, at any rate, I was against the uh, against the Red Sox on the Fourth of July afternoon. I recall that very easily. 
And then Connie Mack had said, uh, uh, he said, I want you to give me six good innings. Can you give me six good innings? And I said, I said, I think so. So he said, don't worry about the end of the game. He said, we have fellows that can take care of that, meaning like Lefty Grove or George Earnshaw. So uh, luckily enough, we didn't need any help and got through the game very easily. And if Moran would be so kind as to ask what happened else in that game, well, I'd be very happy to answer him. What happened? I got three hits. <laughs> Including a double. You see what it says, Lee Tires out there on center field. Pretty good drive. Boom! Off that fence, and I tell you, that fence shook just like it was, just like I tell you, just like a missile hit. Just, and the fact of the matter is that the, the ground crew ran out there. It took them three days to repair that little fire and repair that water. And the danger in the whole thing from crumbling down there after that blast. And uh, that was off Wilsey Moore, too. Did you remember that guy with the good sinker pitch? He made the wrong pitch. <laughs> it is true. Every pitcher wants to talk about their hitting. Um, so, Wade, after Wade retired, he had decided he wanted to work in, in radio, uh, in part because of, uh, he, he had sort of fooled around a little bit on the side with uh, vaudeville and, uh, uh, in the off season, and he had a real knack for it. Um, but the, the, it was very tough in those days for ex-players, uh, unlike today, ex-players are all over the place in broadcasting, but back then, it was really hard for ex-players to break through because this was sort of the golden era of radio, and you needed to have perfect diction, and you needed to be a, a very polished performer in order to become a radio announcer, and that standard was applied to sports casters as well. And so Wade really spent a couple of years fine-tuning the craft and becoming a much more polished uh, interviewer, a caller of play-by-play, -play and so forth. And he came to Cincinnati in 1941. Uh, he really wanted to get the Yankees job or to get a play-by-play -play job in New York, but uh, no such luck. Uh, and so the Cincinnati Club had an opening uh, uh, in 1941. And one of the things I want to say, Cincinnati Club, that, that's not really accurate. Um, in, the, in, in the early days in broadcasting Cincinnati in the 30s, the Reds were not just on one station exclusively like they are today. I mean, WLW owns the, the contract. They are the exclusive providers of Reds play-by-play. -play. But back in the 1930s, early 40s, uh, you, there were three stations in town that carried the Reds. So Wait, in fact, was going to came in at the bequest of Berger Beer because uh, Berger wanted to carry, start carrying the Reds on radio, and he came in here to audition. I believe it was at WKRC, and uh, uh, because they were going to start carrying Reds baseball, and uh, this was just before Pearl Harbor, the fall that winter, just uh, before December 7, 1941. Um, now I lost my little, I it. oh, right here. See, you guys are paying attention. I appreciate this very much. All right, so this is a little story about Ruth, about Wade getting the audition. And I came to uh, Thanksgiving week, Thanksgiving week here in uh, 1941 to make an audition here to broadcast in 1942. In those days, the WKRC was in the basement of the Arms Hotel.
the Rosenberg Brewing Company in that respect. And Berg is stuck with the Reds right on through all those lead days. When they, and there wasn't too much distribution and not too much, too much attention to baseball necessarily then was a secondary matter. So Wade talking about uh, his audition and uh, coming to Cincinnati and broadcasting here during the early days of the war, during the entire war. Uh, he starts here in 42, uh, and his first four seasons are uh, war years. Um, and when he talks about 300 people at Crosley Field, it was, I mean, uh, the Reds were not terribly good. Uh, by 43, 44, 45, they really were starting just to take a dive. And uh, it's hard to imagine 300 people at a major league ball game uh, for an attendance, but he's probably not far off. Uh, the Reds really, uh, as a lot of the teams did, had poor attendance during the war years, plus on top of that, when you're not a very good club. Uh, so it was tough to draw uh, fans to cross the field. Um, let's see what the next slide here. Okay, so these are the stations that Wade worked for in Cincinnati. And uh, he stayed with Burger Beer the entire time. And he moved uh, three or four times to different stations, WSAI, for a couple of seasons in the mid-50s, back to KRC, and then finished his career at WCKY, the last place that he did play-by-play -play in the mid-60s, CKY, Northern Kentucky Station. Uh, he had several broadcast partners over that time period, uh, Dick Nesbitt, uh, Lee Allen was the uh, was a Reds employee, uh, worked in PR for the Reds, later went on to write a couple of really classic baseball books, and in the uh, late 50s became the historian for the National Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown. And uh, he lived here in Hyde Park, and when he moved from Cincinnati, over the years he had collected a number of things, and he, was, he had over two tons of research material, 5,000 pounds of books, correspondence, newspaper clippings, magazines, two tons of stuff. And that, that became really, in a lot of ways, the heart of the collection of uh, Cooperstown. It, it, it really increased their, the, national, the collections in the National Baseball Hall of Fame, Lee Allen. Uh, Jack Moran, of course, uh, was with him for several years, Gene Kelly for a couple of years, and Claude Sullivan in the last couple of seasons, and Sullivan's the one that then took over from Wade and called play-by-play -play for the Reds for a couple of years, and then it was uh, Dick McIntyre, and then finally Al Michaels in the early 70s uh, that came on. But just in terms of, of sort of broadcast milestones and the way Wade was uh, operating, um, so in 1945, they became exclusive rights to just one station. So now uh, Berger and White got the contract with the Reds. There was exclusive, uh, television, exclusive radio rights just to one station. So no more multiple broadcasts. 1949. Prior to 1949, Sunday games were not broadcast on the radio. But after that, they, they began broadcasting. Now that was in Cincinnati. I don't know if that was true other places. 1956, all road games carried live. So prior to 56, Wade often did not travel with the club, but he would have done those games by teletype, by telegraph, uh, sitting in, a, in the radio studios here in Cincinnati while the club's playing in New York or Philadelphia and the ticker tape would come in and you'd hear the little click, 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 click in the background and Wade's reading the uh, accounts of the game uh, off the uh, teletype. And in 1957, when the Dodgers and the Giants moved to with the West Coast from New York uh, to LA and San Francisco, the club did not send Wade on those road games either for the first uh, uh, couple of seasons. And so in the late 60s, you could still hear those teletype broadcasts uh, when the Reds were uh, on the West Coast. Uh, Wade struggled mightily with alcoholism while he was in Cincinnati in his early years. And ironically, his sponsors, you know, Burger Beer. Uh, but Wade fell off the, he, he really had some rough times in the mid-40s. And um, 
His family was somewhat used to this. This wasn't the, you know, the first time or the first times that he had these issues. But especially in 40, I think this is in 44, he, um, he disappeared uh, after a broadcast one day. He just disappeared. And he didn't show up the next day for the next day's broadcast, and nobody could find him. And he was missing for two or three days, and he had, he had gone to the Netherland Hotel, into a hotel room in the Netherland, and whiskey bottles, and you know, with dr drinking a lot of whiskey, wound up uh, on the streets of Cincinnati, and uh, was found a couple of days later sitting on a curb on Long Reading Road. Uh, they took him to the hospital, and he dried out, and uh, the club in the meantime was trying to figure out what they were, how they were gonna deal with this, uh, everybody kind of knew, they sort of suspected what was going on. Uh, and uh, when Wade returned, uh, the club put out a press release that uh, Wade has been uh, found and he's okay and he'll be back to work soon. He was uh, suffering from amnesia, uh, which of course was not true. And anybody who knew Wade knew it wasn't true. And supposedly, Within a couple of days, a telegram arrives at the Hoyt household, and it's from Babe Ruth. And Ruth uh, sends a telegram, you know, glad to hear you're fine. Amnesia, huh? Must be a new brand. <laughs> <laughs> but Wait recovered from that, and that was his final bout. He discovered Alcoholics Anonymous, and he became a big supporter and booster of AA the rest of his life. And Berger stuck with him. I keep pointing at you, sir, because you've got that Berger T-shirt. Yeah. Berger stayed with him uh, during that whole time and uh, didn't pull, didn't didn't cancel his contract. And he was always really grateful to Berger Beer for that. So in the early '60s, Waits, these these stories that you're hearing, the the radio stories on the rain delays, had become so famous and so well known. There were two albums that were put out. One called The Best of Wade Hoyt in the Rain, which has to be one of the greatest album covers of all. I mean, it's just perfect, right? The burger beer under his arm, the trench coat on, the raincoat with the umbrella and the microphone. I mean, it's just a great cover. And then the second one was um, the collection just of his stories of uh, Babe Ruth. And so here's a couple of his Babe Ruth stories for you. Um, one will involve Calvin Coolidge, the president, coming to uh, see a game and to greet the Yankees. Um, and then another story involves um, a political event right after the World Series, and I think this was 1928, and uh, Al Smith was the Democratic uh, candidate. He, Al Smith, of course, was from New York, and uh, many of the Yankees uh, were supporting him, and so they had a, Al Smith had a rally and invited the Yankees to come and speak. And so just right after the World Series, they go to speak. So there's two stories, one about uh, the, uh, the, the, the Calvin Coolidge story, the President Coolidge, and then the second one about Al Smith. And I, there might be a third one. Uh, and if, it's, if it is the third one, it involves uh, Wade in, a, uh, in his brand new car traveling in Miami and uh, he is uh, uh, greeted at a gas station by a woman that they, they, he describes it as uh, from the Palm Beach 400, I think, or the Miami Beach 400, which basically means high society type woman, and, and Wade has an encounter with, a brief encounter with her. So, so those, I believe I've got all three of those stories, so let's take a listen to Wade telling Babe Ruth stories. This was Cal Coolidge. Well, you know Cal Coolidge. He never said many words. He wasn't given a great speech or oratory. And, and, uh, and we were just before a game in a very hot day over there. That the, uh, we were just to go to the clubhouse to change our undershirts before the ball game was going to start. Someone said, don't go in the club. I said, uh, my, uh, President Coolidge is going to be out here. And you fellows have to line up and meet President Coolidge. This was at the Yankee Stadium. So once again we lined up, and once again Babe's going to make this speech of welcome. So he's on the end of the line, and I never forget this, he's coming along and mopping his brow. Boy, it's a hot day, I tell you, it's so hot, and the perspiration is running down our faces, and we stopped in front of Cal Coolidge and, and said, uh, how do you do, Mr. President, it's very nice to have you here, and we hope you enjoy the game, and he muttered something, thank you, boys, I hope so, yes, and gave us 
sort of a nice smile, and finally it became Ruth's turn to make this speech again, and Ruth stood in front of Coolidge, and Coolidge looked at Ruth, Ruth looked at Coolidge, and neither of them spoke there for what seemed an, an interminable length of time, and finally Ruth said, hey, Fred, how does that paint it? there to the Democratic National Headquarters and go on a radio show at 8 o'clock for uh, uh, Al Smith. And those of us who were Democratic at that time are going to vote for Smith would uh, uh, go on this radio show. Oh, yeah, well, I said, sure, Al Smith was a New Yorker born and bred, and we all had uh, those of us who were born in New York, it's sort of a, a, a local affection for, for Al Smith. So we all went up the show, but Ruth went up there, Luke Gary, Tony Lazari, and this different crowd, Earl Holmes, I think, is there. Uh, so anyway, we, we were up in this suite of rooms at the Democratic National Headquarters, and we had dinner up there, and we met Mrs. Smith and all the young Smiths and Al and all the bunch. And we had quite a nice time. And we had dinner there, and after dinner, I approached the hour for the radio show, and, and uh, the master of ceremonies took over at 8 o'clock, and the... Uh, I had told, given Ruth instructions because Ruth was going to introduce all the ball players. He was going to act as the master of ceremonies on behalf of the, uh, the ball players. So uh, this fellow started in and he said, ladies and gentlemen, from coast to coast, in those days, you see, in 1928, it was quite a thing to have a coast to coast hookup. That was in the earlier days of radio. And in those days, it was quite a, a, a unique thing to hook up an entire chain from coast to coast. So I said, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to understand that this uh, broadcast tonight is coming to you direct from the Democratic National Headquarters in New York City. And we're having a post to host hook up here. We have a lot of prominent people, senators, congressmen of all descriptions. He says governors of the different states who he said who are here in support of Al Smith, our, our great Democratic nominee for the President of the United States. He said we also have here a group of the world champion New York Yankees. So well, he said we would like you to meet, and he said I know that these fellows have just arrived back from winning a championship in St. Louis, and they have just gotten off the train, and they are anxious to go to their homes, so we are going to present them first. He says, and acting as the master of ceremonies, he says, there is the great Babe Ruth. He said, Babe, he said, step up here, and he said, tell us about the New York uh, Yankees and who these fellows are going to vote for. And he says, uh, Babe, tell us about it. He says, well, Babe says, uh, I'm Babe Ruth. He says, I want you to know. He says, I want you to know. He says that uh, I got here with me a lot of fellows that played in this World Series with me. And he says, they're great fellows. He says, now, the first fellow I'm going to introduce to you is the fellow that pressed me hard for the home run championship this year. That was Larry and Luke Gehrig. He says, a New York boy born and bred. He says, not born so far from Al Smith. A fellow who's known Al Smith since when he was a kid. He says, step up here, Lou, and tell us who you're going to vote for. So a little in that little high piping voice, he stepped up and he said, well, he says, I'm going to vote for Al Smith. I think he's a great guy. He says, and I uh, know him all my life. He says, and I think I will make you a great president. He says, and I want you to cast your vote for Al Smith. Oh, that a boy, Lou, that a boy, says, babe. Says, that a boy. He says, now, he says, the next one, he says, I'm going to introduce to you. He says, a, uh, brother, I want everybody on the Pacific Coast, everybody living around San Francisco and Oakland. He says, I want you to pay strict attention to what I'm going to say because this is one of your fellows I'm going to introduce to you. He says, we have a fellow playing second base for us, another great home run hitter. He says, one of those fellows, he says, out there from San Francisco and Oakland around in that territory, he says, known to the fans here in the New York City is push him up Tony Lazari. He says, Tony, step up and tell us who the Dagos are going to vote for us. He used to have an automobile we call the Ghost of Riverside Drive. It was a long mom and automobile. It looked like a, it looked like a, you know, one of those big more, racing jobs. More than that was before they had lights in more, New York. He used to race that thing up and down Fifth Ave, uh, Riverside Drive. And he lost the, uh, the radiator cap and the rusty water used to spout out of the radiator. And they, he wore that thing out for about a year. And he traded it in and he got a Packard. And I believe it was the uh, uh, first Packard with four wheel brakes. And uh, at any rate, he had it down, he toured down to Florida in the thing, and he, he came to Palm Beach, and he uh, pulled into a gas pump in Palm Beach, and he ordered a tank of gas. Well, this gas attendant took a look at that big face of Ruth, you know, that, and he, you know, anybody could recognize Babe Ruth. He says, hey, should it, uh, ain't you Babe Ruth? And Ruth, in a sort of a sem semi-modesty, said, uh, yeah, he says, that's me, what? So what about it? He said, gee, where's Mr. Ruth? Certainly glad to see you. Gee, was this a privilege? Oh, boy, am I glad to meet you. And just as they were talking together, 
in at the, at the adjacent pump pulled a big Rolls Royce with one of the 400 of Palm Beach sitting in the, in the back, and uh, uh, there was a chauffeur-driven uh, chauffeur Rolls, and out got the chauffeur, and he asked uh, the attendant for a tank of gas for the, for the Rolls Royce, and the, the attendant at the gas station told the chauffeur, he said, you know who that is, that other, that fat packet over there? That's Babe Ruth. So the chauffeur took a look over there at Babe, and he was, became a little fascinated by the sight of Ruth, because Ruth had a tremendously magnetic personality, and you had to sense his presence no matter where he was, and uh, finally the chauffeur went back and said to the man, he said, man, he's in uh, that fellow in the back of that other automobile, that's that great baseball player, that, 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 that's that Babe Ruth. So the madam gave it the old lawn yet and was looking at him out of her eyeglass and, and they had their fingers up to her eyes looking through the lawn yet at Babe, and Babe happened to look up and spot her. So she became somewhat flustered and had to say something, so she said to Ruth, uh, I uh, ask you, Mr. Ruth, that great baseball player, and Ruth said, uh, yeah, he said, that's me. So she said, oh, Mr. Ruth, she said, I've been admiring your motor. She said, uh, that is one of those new motors, is it not? She said, one of those cars with the four-wheel brakes. Ruth says, yeah, some fun, huh? So she said, yes, Mr. Ruth, it is quite an automobile. He said, uh, she said, tell me, are those brakes mechanical or are they hydraulic? And they said, madam, he said, gee whiz, he says, I haven't got the slightest consumption. <laughs> uh, I... Part of what I really like about that story is that is some of the expressions that Hoyt uses about the motor, the motor, the car, calling it the motor. And uh, uh, he, at one point, he said something about this woman in the other car. And by the way, those were stock photos. I mean, I really don't know if she had a dog on her lap or not. But anyway, uh, he said he gave her the old longe, the longe, which is there those old eyeglasses you would hold up, I guess. And uh, so that's what she had her little eyeglasses out to look to look at the babe uh, anyway just three cute stories uh, that you would have heard if you'd have been listening to Reds baseball back in the 50s and 60s the kind of stuff Wade would talk about um, Wade did call only he only was able to call one World Series the Reds were only in one World Series during his 20 uh, plus years with the Reds and that was in 1961 um, and he, he, that's him with uh, Gene Freeze right there in the Reds uh, clubhouse. Um, and we do have, there is audio of this, but I wasn't able to, to get it. Uh, there, there's a little bit of audio that has been recorded from that World Series that is out there of uh, Wade. But here's a shot of Crosley Field. I, I, I don't know if any of you were lucky enough to be at the 61 World Series. You were two years old. Uh, the 60, you weren't even, you were the, the but the 61 World Series, uh, the big scoreboard at Crosley Field over there on the, uh, the left side, the sun deck over there on the right, the bleachers. And in center field, uh, I'm not sure if you can pick this up or not, but there, there were a lot of onlookers gathered out there on the new I-75, which was under construction. And they had torn down a lot of the buildings that were right behind Crosley Field for all those years and were building what was then referred to as the Mill Creek Expressway later becomes I-75 South. So if you're heading south on I-75, right at the Western Avenue exit, uh, if you're heading south and you look just to your right, that's right where across the field would have been. Wade retired in 1965. This was his retirement day, uh, his last season with, uh, with the Reds. Uh, this was one of his last games that he broadcast at Crosley Field. The club wound up on the road to finish that season, and they ended up in San Francisco, which is where Wade called his last uh, Reds game. Um, and we do have some audio of that, of his last broadcast. So I'm going to just play a little bit of a clip from, it, it'll, this is in Candlestick, well, no, it wouldn't have been Candlestick, well, not sure when Candlestick opened. Um, but it was in San Francisco. And uh, a gentleman, uh, a pitcher named Dick Estelle, and he refers to Estelle a couple of times. So it's Dick Estelle is the, is the uh, Cardinal pitcher. Uh, Leo Cardenas, uh, the red shortstop, has tripled to start the inning. So he's on third base. And then what you're gonna kind of hear, Billy McCool is the pitcher. Uh, he'll ground out. Tommy Harper then comes to the plate, then followed by Tommy Helms, uh, and then Beta Pinson. So we'll just listen to a little of weight play by play. I 
getting ready to work again. Go. Benson takes it for ball four, and that's the sixth base on ball in four innings that Young and Stell has given up. So Harper's on third. Benson is on first. The batter is Frank Robinson, who walked in the second inning and flied out to deep center in the third. He hit him in the third inning, Robinson hit a ball for 400 feet. And uh, it was caught by Willie Mays. So I'm sorry it's not a more dramatic moment. Uh, and we don't hear Frank's at bat. Uh, that's, that's the extent of the clip that, uh, is a, that we had. Uh, the Robinson did go ahead and get a single, and the Reds went up three to one, but they initially lost that game six to three. Uh, but that, the other interesting thing about that is that was Frank Robinson's, turned out to be Frank Robinson's last game uh, as a Cincinnati Red, also the last game that uh, Wake would uh, broadcast. Wake, um, did call some TV uh, in the early 70s, uh, kind of came back to broadcasting. After he retired, he became a, he dabbled a lot in uh, painting. Uh, he became uh, quite the uh, painter. Uh, here he is doing a painting of Crosley Field there on the right, another one of his landscapes uh, or uh, piece back there on the, uh, but, uh, on the left. Uh, but he, he did some baseball topics, but not too many. But one of them one that he did was Big Clue. Uh, and uh, uh, this, this is his Klazuski piece. Uh, over the years, uh, they've been collected. They sell a little bit here and there, but you don't see them on the market too often. I think most of them are hanging and, you know, there's still enough people around that recalled Wade or knew them that they've uh, hung on to these. There, there's not that many of them. Um, Wade passed away in the mid-80s, 1984. Uh, he died his, oh, and there's one more little piece, uh, and it's a, uh, I'll wait here and get to it in a minute, but it is uh, an interview that Marty Brenneman did with Wade on, on Wade's 80th birthday. Uh, and they were having a day for him at Riverfront Stadium, and uh, uh, Marty interviewed Wade. It was in the late, it would have been 70, Nine, 1979. But before I play that, because that kind of ends with a little tribute to Wade and, and, and sort of a reflections on all the guys, you know, everybody from the Reds of the late 40s when he first started, Ewell Blackwells and on through the Klazuskis and the McMillans and the Temples and the Robinsons and the Pinsons and the Roses and so forth. So, uh, but I'll conclude with that. But let me just see if you've got questions here in the meantime before we before I show that last little piece. Yeah. So Wade Wade actually worked for Burton Beer, not the Right, yeah. exactly. Uh, unlike today, uh, where, the, where these guys are paid by the clubs, but back in that time period, he was an employee of Burger Beer. Yeah. Any other? Yeah. No, he, he made his home here and remained in Cincinnati. Uh, I mean, in, in 42, when he came here, he moved here and that became his home. Uh, and he was here the rest of his life. Um, his kids went to school here. Uh, he, had, he had a son that went to school here. He, he had uh, three marriages. His first one ended when he was still in, before he moved to Cincinnati. And he had one or two children by that marriage. And then his second marriage, I think he had the one son, who he, become, he became estranged from later in life, and I'm not sure exactly what that was all about. And I don't know how much they reconciled. Um, I, I think somewhat, but not completely. Um, and then his second wife developed uh, dementia, and she had some serious health problems in her last several years of her life and uh, she passed away and Wade remarried at the age, he died I think at the age of, well see, he died in 84, so he would have, would have been about 84, 85 years old. And he married again just like the last two years of his life. He married a woman named Betty, can't think of her maiden name. But she, he had gotten to know her because in the 60s, the, um, the office of the National League president was in Cincinnati. 
Uh, and so the, the National League office was here. Uh, and she worked as secretary in the office. And she always told a story. She, she was a delightful person. I mean, she only wound up being married away for, you know, two years before he passed away. She lived on into the early 2000s. Uh, but she said that when she interviewed for the job, that uh, Warren Giles, who was a longtime Reds uh, president and general manager of the club, took on the presidency of the National League. And so Mr. Giles is interviewing her, and he wants to know if she happens to know uh, the standings of the National League, uh, because if, after all, she's going to work in here, she ought to know. Well, she not only, and this is, of course, back in the time, there were like 16, 18 teams or whatever, and uh, she rattled them off, and not only did she know the National League, she knew the American League standings as well. You're hired. Uh, the good little story, but that's how Wade got, Wade met her uh, in, in there, and uh, I think as his wife declined and, and that, that he, he and Betty became a kind of a couple, social couple, and then he married her after, they were married after uh, his wife died. Yeah? So did Wayne Point ever have any stories about the relationship between Avery and Lou Gehrig? Um, I, it's, the question was, did Wade tell stories about the nature of the relationship between Gehrig and Ruth? And I don't recall, but there might have been some on the albums. I don't recall that. Wade wrote a number of little pieces over the years, little articles and uh, some radio, little radio pieces that he wrote. And they're on, they're in the uh, Cincinnati Historical Society library. Uh, and so, th so that would be another source of possible, of possible, but I don't know that. Wade often toyed with the, uh, later in life he toyed with the idea of writing a book on Ruth and he never did. Uh, which is too bad because it would have been great if he could have done that. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yes, he lived in um, Mount Lookout, Tusculum area. Over, uh, I've been on the street and I can't remember the name of it now, but he lived in that area. Buried in Spring Grove. Yes, he is buried in Spring Grove. Buried in Spring Grove Cemetery. That is correct. Okay, I'll, we'll wrap this up with this little interview with Marty, which takes about uh, four minutes, I think. And then there's a, about a two minute tribute to wait after that. So we'll, we'll wrap this up with that. This particular free game show in the course of the season, if you have an opportunity to talk to people that mean a great deal to you. The man we have is our guest on touching bases today. It's been very special to me in the five plus years I've been in Cincinnati because he early on offered me a lot of encouragement. I came to know that uh, it's one of the most well-loved people in the city of Cincinnati, is now and always will be. They're honoring him on his 80th birthday today. And it's, a, it's a great honor to have the opportunity to talk with you, Wade Hoyt, on a very special day in your honor of this city. Well, it's very nice of you to invite me, Marty, and you and Joe I have a great reverence for. Wait, uh, you think back to coming to Cincinnati in 1942 to broadcast the Red Side Radio. Did you ever think it would come to this, the day of your honor in this city? No, I never did because I was ready to go home a week after I got there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, you see, the war broke out. And it, uh, I came here on January the 2nd, 1942, and the, December the 7th, prior to that, in 41, the war had started. And we didn't know whether we were going to have baseball or not. I didn't know whether I was uh, going to last here. And we had three stations doing uh, broadcasting then. And of course, there were uh, Roger Baker and Dick Gray, and those fellows were established here. And then they rang in Sam Fuller and Al Stevens, and we had uh, things pretty well cluttered up around here. Uh, but we managed to last it anyway. And, and, uh, and uh, I don't think I was very good the first year I broadcast. Well, I'm uh, meaning I was, let's say I was particularly lousy and got a little better. <laughs> Wait, you know, there was an excellent piece done on you in the Cincinnati Inquirer this morning by Bill Ford, uh, going back and uh, recollecting your career as a pitcher and, of course, uh, briefly as a broadcaster here in Cincinnati. You've had some great things happen to you, have Yes, I have. I've had a very exciting life. As they say, from the peaks, the top to the bottom. 
from a lot of success and a great deal of failure and uh, a firm belief in God and, uh, uh, and human beings and a firm belief in people and a firm belief in the city of Cincinnati and uh, it has been justified and I am now reaping the rewards not in money, not in material gain, uh, but I would say in humanities. And I have a lot of friends, and it's been proven and, uh, by the events of today. And I, I was never a happier guy alive than, than I am at the present time, with the exception, if I may introduce a note of despondency here, because of Mrs. Foyt, who uh, is very ill and will never recover. And that, of course, is uh, a cause for regret. Uh, but taking it from the other angle, the city of Cincinnati has has been so good to me that it is impossible for me to uh, to put into words or even coin phrases to uh, match their generosity, their belief in me, their kindness to me, and their patience with me. So if any of you have more questions or memories or thoughts about weight, uh, be happy to.